Hello Internet, my name is Quinn and this is Blondie Hacks. So today we're going to work on making this delightful set of little machinist jacks with optional integrated T-bolt. This is a great little afternoon project and uh, so, some uh, really interesting mistakes are going to be made. So I will show you those. Stay tuned to the end for that. Okay, let's dive in. Here's the design of the machinist jack that we're going to make in Fusion 360. There are as many designs for machinist jacks as there are machinists, but this is my particular take on it, and models and drawings for this will be available on my Patreon. Now, it's not like you need drawings for a machinist jack, but uh, I made them just for the benefit of anybody who might be interested. So as you can see, it's a basic barrel type screw jack and uh, the, the pink portion is the body and the yellow portion is the, the jack itself. And then there is an optional T-bolt that uh, threads into the bottom. And the T-bolt and the jack itself have the same thread on them. So you can just easily cut one thread all the way through. And so that way, if you want to or need to bolt the machinist jack down onto your T-slots on your mill, uh, then you have the option of doing that. Now, if you want to do this as a lathe-only project, you can just skip the T-bolt. It's uh, optional. Uh, but I think this is a good project to do if you've just bought a mill and uh, you need some machinist jacks because machinist jacks, frankly, aren't all that useful on the lathe. And I do recommend making more than one of these. So I'm going to make two in two different sizes kind of simultaneously here. I'll be showing you bits and pieces from each of those as we go along. But we're going to start with the main body of the jack shown there in pink. So I've got some scrap 12L14 round bar chucked up in the lathe here and I'm taking a, a pass off the top here just to get it concentric and uh, then we can blue it up and mark out our dimensions that we're going to need here. And then we'll do some cutting fluid on there and start turning. And the great thing about this project is that virtually no dimension on it is critical. So uh, you can just kind of have fun with it. So I'm setting up my shoulder there for the uh, body of the jack. And this is our finishing pass. And we're aiming for 800 and eh, about that. We kind of nailed it. All right, now we can just deburr those leading corners there while we've got it in here. And now I'm going to part it off. Now, a quick note about this setup. I've got the stock stuck way out because I'm going to do the body and the top part of one jack all in one setup. And so I'm parting most of the way through with the tail support in place, which is not something you normally want to do but I don't part it all the way off. And then I pull the tail support out and finish the parting. And by doing that, I can part really far away from the chuck like that. And that allows me to reuse this setup as I'm doing here for the next piece of the jack. So I'm facing off the end once again. And then we go back in with our number two center drill so we can get some tail support going. And once again, I blew up the part and mark the dimensions for the top part of this jack and then mark it again in the correct spot. Sometimes it takes two tries. Math is hard. And once again taking a skim cut off the top so I can set a zero on my indicator for this deep shoulder that we're going to be creating. And then I get busy with the turn-in. We've got a long way to go here so taking aggressive cuts and not at all worried about surface finish. And then on my final pass, I crank up the speed and crank down the feed and do a nice finish pass. And then when I get into that corner there, I lock the carriage and wind out to face the shoulder. And then I go back in here and uh, I'm cutting in a little bit of a relief on the inside corner of this shoulder. And uh, that serves two purposes. One, if you're going to single point cut these threads, it gives you your run out area for that, for that operation. Or if you're just going to use a die, you still want that relief in there so that the top of the jack will seat all the way down on the top surface of the body of the jack. Now I'm going to single point cut these threads for no reason other than it was a fun chance to, to get some practice at doing that, but there's absolutely no need to do that. You can just cut these threads with a die and that'll be just fine. But if you are going to cut the threads on a benchtop hobbyist lathe such as this one, 
That means one thing, it's change gears time. So the clamp hardware that I use has a 7 20 thread, and I'm matching that with this machinist jack so I can use the, uh, the same uh, hardware to mount it to my table as everything else. And so I've got my change gears set up for a uh, 20 threads per inch. And uh, this is a, uh, a, an outward sort of upside down threading technique that uh, I learned from uh, Joe Pizinski. So you should uh, definitely go check out his videos as well. Just by running the lathe in reverse and flipping the threading tool over, it takes all the drama out of threading towards the shoulder. And then a quick deburr. And a quick test fit. And it's looking good. Now wait a minute, that body wasn't done yet. What happened there? Yeah, well, like I said, I made two of these at once and uh, I'm skipping around a little bit, but I'm trying to show the steps here in uh, a sequential order that uh, is, is the easiest order of operations. So now that we've got uh, the main parts done for uh, the body and, and the top, uh, now we can switch out to the four jaw chuck with the uh, soft jaws on there and start the second operations on, e on each of the parts. So we flip the top of, of the jack around and surface the top of it. You want that top to be nice and parallel, nice and flat. And then we do the same with the bottom of the body of the jack. And we need to do one more thing with the body of the jack. We want to, to cut kind of a dish in the bottom side of it, and that will make it sit more precisely flat on the mill table. If you try to make something that's just completely flat across the bottom, it's never gonna sit exactly perfect. So by putting a dish in the bottom, you have less surface area touching the mill table, and it's more likely to sit flat. And then the customary deer burring. And that's starting to look like something. All right, now we're gonna cut the hole all the way through the base. So back in again with the number two center drill. And uh, as I said, we're gonna be cutting the 7 16 20. So I need to go all the way up to the uh, tapping drill size for 7 16 So I'm going up in a couple of stages. And now we can set up our 7 16 20 tap with a spring-loaded tap follower there and just tap that guy all the way through. And a quick deburr to make it look nice. Okay. So now I'm going to knurl that ring around the base, and uh, this will make more sense when you see how the whole jack goes together, but we want the top and the bottom of it of the jack to both be knurled. And now I'm abusing my threading tool to uh, chamfer the edges there. And a quick test fit of those two parts, and that's looking pretty good. Now I'm going to cold blue the parts, and uh, I'll do one here just so you can see the process. So you start by cleaning it thoroughly with acetone, and then I'm using Jax cold blue here, which uh, Jax works best for parts that can be fully immersed, so things that aren't very big. And uh, so you just drop the part in there, and let it sit for a minute, and then you pull it out and rinse it in water. Now that last step is important. If you don't rinse it off to stop the reaction, you'll get kind of a flash rusting effect. And then we dry that off. Now the finish on the top of this guy is not super even. You can buff it out with like some triple zero steel wool, or uh, you can just hit it with a little scotch bright and uh, give it another treatment. Uh, so you can fool around with this, but uh, yeah, the finish comes out to varying degrees of quality. It depends largely on the surface finish quality of the part itself, but uh, here you can see it assembled with the base that has also been cold blued. And like I said, we're making two. Okay, with the two jacks made, now I'm going to make the T-bolt for the bottom. And as I say, this is totally optional. Uh, I made it because I thought it might be a, a useful thing. And in practice, it's debatable how useful it is because it isn't that often that a, a T-slot on the mill table happens to line up with the place that you need the machinist jack to sit in. But yeah, it was fun to do anyway. So I'm making this T-bolt from some mild steel bar stock. So I apply the uh, port band to it with extreme prejudice to get a rough cut. And then it's over to the mill to square up this stock. So I'm going to be using this uh, two inch shell mill, which uh, is a very convenient way to face off all six sides. And then I set this up in the vise on some parallels. And because all six sides of this are bandsaw cut, uh, nothing is even close to square. So I just pick 
what looks like maybe the squarest corner and I put that down and against the fixed jaw and I use a piece of round bar to clamp the front of it and then that's sort of approximating square so you can square it up with hopefully removing the least amount of material. And tappy tap tap. So I start by facing off the top and I try to face off as little material as I can just to make sure I don't uh, undershoot my uh, desired final dimensions anywhere. And I thought this was my finishing pass, but of course there's still a low spot. Once that top is machined, then I place that side against the fixed jaw, that's my first reference surface, and then I once again clamp the unmachined side with a piece of round bar, and I face off the edge next to it. And then once I have two sides machined, that forms an accurate 90 degree corner, which then can go down into the back of the vise, and I can do the remaining sides. And then once the stock is squared up, then I can come in here with uh, my four flute end mill and uh, dimension it to the final size. And then I can clean up the ends as well, just so all six sides are nice. This is obviously massive overkill for a T-bolt that uh, will have a hard life and nobody will ever see, but uh, it's always good practice to make things nice. Okay, so now I'm going to set up for drilling the hole, and uh, to do that I'm centering the block with the DRO, and then once I've got it centered I can move it using the DRO out to the distance I need for my shoulder cut plus half the radius of my end mill. And then I just make a series of passes downward to cut that shoulder. And this end mill is both inexpensive and kind of dull, so it's not doing a great job. Alright, so a quick check with our depth gauge here just to see how we are doing. So I'm aiming for 350, so I got a couple more thou to go, and then what I will do is zero the z-axis on my DRO, and then I can cut the other shoulder to that same depth without having to measure it. So once again, cutting the other side, and I'm feeding in the other direction now so that I'm not climb milling, and that's starting to look like a T-something or other. And just to keep me honest, I'll go ahead and measure the other shoulder, and it looks like I came in a couple tenths over, so not too bad. Once again, this is a T-bolt, not precision machinery. Now in goes the Jacobs chuck, so we can drill that hole in the middle that the threaded stud is going to press into, as you saw in the fusion drawing. So I'm going to go ahead and center drill this guy. And again, I didn't have to change anything in my setup here because I already had the DRO zero, so I just had to move everything back to zero, and away we go. So I'm drilling in a couple of stages up to uh, one size below my 7 16 reamer. So I'm aiming for a 2 thou press fit on this guy, which is probably overkill, but uh, eh, make it strong. Okay, and in we go with the 7 16 reamer. And a quick test fit on the actual T-slots of the mill to see how we did. The part itself's all deburred and looking pretty swanky. And that slides in there very nicely. And the second test you want to do is pull it up and make sure that the top surface of the T-bolt remains below the surface of the table, because if it is uh, at or above the surface of the table, you won't actually get clamping force from it, so there needs to be some space there. So now we're going to make the thread stud that is uh, going to get pressed into that T-bolt base. So back over to the lathe and another piece of scrap. So we're aiming for 439 and a half thousandths, which will be a 2 thou press fit on a 7 16 hole. 7 16 being 4375. And uh, I ended up uh, at 4340 on the lathe, and uh, so rather than try to get that last half thou, I just took some emery paper to it and brought it down right on 4395. So that's a good feeling. Now the threaded portion of this shaft actually needs to be a couple thou under 4375 just to uh, enable cutting with the die, and uh, so I'm going to just skim that half of the shaft very lightly. And another 
they're deburring and it's looking good. And over to the tailstock die holder now with my 7 16 20 die. And we can go ahead and cut those threads in there all the way up to that little barely perceptible shoulder that we made. And this is once again 12L14 steel, so those threads cut very nicely. And now we can part this guy off. And Yahtzee. And then we flip it around once again and we face off the back side of it and face it down to the final length. I always part it off a little longer than I'm going to need. Now we need to press it into that T-bolt base and uh, as is tradition I still do not have an arbor press and so I am once again abusing my bench vise. So I put a little Loctite 603 on there and then I line it up and press it home. A tooth out press fit on a, an object this size is sort of towards the upper limit of what I feel good doing on my bench vise, but uh, it's still still fine. I press that guy in until the threads are kind of at the top of the T-bolt and the stud is not all the way through, so it won't interfere with that T-bolt sitting flat if it needs to. And now it's back into the jacks for all the rest of the parts. You would, of course, normally do them all at once anyway. And here's a final assembly of one of the jacks with that T-bolt, so you can kind of see how it works. So here's how a machinist jack is frequently used. Uh, there are times, uh, more often than you'd think, when you have to work outboard of the vise. For whatever reason, you can't do the operation directly in the jaws. So you're working way out here. And while this end is secure, you're losing a ton of rigidity with all of this overhang. So here's where our little friend, the machinist jack, comes in. We can just slide this guy in there and snug it up against the bottom of our part and already we've gained a ton of rigidity and uh, sometimes this is enough but uh, where possible it's also a good idea to then place a strap clamp on the top of that as well and uh, tighten that guy down and that's going to give you maximum rigidity but sometimes there isn't room for the clamp up here if you're doing your operation on the top of the part for example out here uh, so uh, in those cases the machinist jack by itself uh, does help a lot. Of course like everything else in machining uh, can't be just that simple. There is a little bit of technique for using these guys. Uh, it's important not to over tighten them against the underside of the work because, well, the word jack is right there in the name. These are a jack and you can either deflect this part or push it right out of the vise if you uh, jack it up too firmly. So uh, just for giggles, I put a dial test indicator on the top of this part here so you can see that effect. So uh, right there is kind of where I would want it. So it's it's firmly touching about the feel, same feel as you would get with a micrometer where it's the surfaces are firmly touching but you're not pushing on either surface. And uh, if I keep going, you can see what happens here. The part starts to deflect and or shift up out of the vise. So it's very easy to get carried away with this guy and in your pursuit of rigidity you might actually cost yourself precision. And then here's a demo of how that T-bolt works if uh, by some luck of the universe the place that you need a machinist jack happens to line up with a T-slot on your mill table. I haven't actually had that happen yet but I like the idea so much that uh, I'm super glad I made it. And here you can also see why the uh, bottom ring of the machinist jack is knurled so that you can use it to tighten the base against the T-bolt. Okay, I promised you mistakes, so let's take a look at the first one. Uh, so on the taller of the two jacks here, uh, everything seems fine, it works great, but if I wind it most of the way out, you can see that the threads get very wobbly. So what happened here? Well, uh, a section of the threads in here are, ended up getting cut oversized, so there's kind of a taper in there. And uh, uh, this actually stumped me for a little while. I wasn't sure how that happened. And I actually caught it when I went back and watched my own video of tapping this. So look what's happening here. And there's a bunch of things that have gone wrong here. So you can see that uh, uh, my tailstock isn't properly locked. You can see it moving all over the place. And uh, I just didn't notice at the time. And the second thing that's happening is notice how much effort it's taking me to do this tapping. I'm using the full leverage on the tap wrench. So I should have noticed 
right off the bat that something was wrong there. So uh, how did that happen? So here's why I was working so hard to tap that hole. So uh, let's take a look at the uh, 7 16 14 and uh, the, uh, the typical home gamer tap and die set that you use, for example, specifies uh, the drill size U for that tap, the letter drill U. Now, uh, everyone always talks about uh, the, the tapping drill size as though there's only one for any given thread, but actually you can choose different sizes. So here's a different chart that shows 7 16 14, also shows the U, but there's a second option here of 25 64 and this second option is what 22 thou larger. So why does this chart have two options? Well, if we scroll up a little bit, you can see this detailed chart is from littlemachineshop.com, hashtag not sponsored. And they offer two different options, a 75% engagement thread and a 50% engagement thread. And they recommend the 75 for aluminum, brass, plastics, and the 50 for steel and other uh, tougher materials. So your typical home gamer chart uh, that came with your tap and die set uh, is only offering the 75% option. So I uh, consciously made the 75% choice here because I was thinking, oh, it's a precision tool. I should, you know, get the maximum thread engagement. Uh, but that really wasn't necessary, and especially since I was planning to single point the threads, there was really no need to do this, and it made my tapping job work a lot harder, and then combine that with my tailstock that wasn't super secure, and, well, you end up with an oversized and tapered thread. So the good news is I was actually able to recover from that. Uh, this jack works fine. Uh, the, uh, the, the advantage I had was that I opted to single point cut these threads. And so I was able to tailor these threads specifically to their mating thread. So even though this thread was uh, a little oversized at one end and quite a bit oversized at the other, I was able to cut this thread slightly oversized to uh, the point where actually a regular 7 16 20 nut will not thread onto uh, the, the jack uh, shaft there. Uh, but the whole thing works perfectly well in this tube here. So while the uppermost quarter of travel here is, is kind of sloppy, the vast majority of the usable range of the jack uh, still works perfectly fine. And truth be told, a little bit of uh, wobble in that thread doesn't really matter because the only forces on a machinist jack are going to be in the downward direction anyway. Now you saw me single point cut these threads, but I actually did it three times for just the two parts. Uh, this is the good one, the one that I showed, but uh, I had done these two previously. Uh, now, from a distance, these might all look like perfectly normal threads, but let's take a closer look. Now, I know it's a little hard to see because they're black, but on top here is the correct thread, and the bottom one is the messed up one. Now, if you look closely here on the edge, you see these threads have kind of a sawtooth shape to them, and these ones have the proper 60 degree V. So what caused that to happen? So here's the compound on my lathe, set up at the typical 29.5 or frankly 30 degrees uh, that you use for single point thread cutting. So what's the problem? So there are two dirty little secrets to th single point thread cutting that I'm gonna tell you today. The first is this guy right here. You saw that my compound was set at 30 degrees, but this guy's reading 60. What the heck's going on? The answer is that this is a Chinese lathe and Chinese lathes have there's zero on the compound set 90 degrees off from American and I presume also British lathes. So all the books are gonna tell you to set this guy at 30 and then dial it in with a protractor. But in fact, if you have a Chinese lathe, this guy is showing the total included angle, not the 30 degrees that you want with uh, like an American lathe. So to recap, Chinese compound zero right there, American compound zero right there. If you get that wrong, you're reading off by 30 degrees when you set up for thread cutting and you're going to get your sawtooth threads. This took me quite a while to figure out, which is why I cut multiples of those parts. Uh, but uh, now I'm going to tell you the other dirty little secret of single point thread cutting. These hideous sawtooth threads that no insecure perfectionist would ever show on YouTube actually work just fine. If your pitch is correct, the shape of the thread is actually way less important than people make it out to be. For something like a machinist jack where forces on it are only in one direction, it just it still works just fine. So don't get too crazy. Uh, if your threads aren't the right shape or they're not exactly the right dimension, if the pitch is right, they're probably still going to work. And you know, for something like this where it just isn't that critical, uh, then yeah, just go for it. Use them. It's fine. Everything's going to be okay. Now, obviously, if you're making production parts for you know, other people or for critical machinery in the field or for a precise tool where it really matters, then yeah, obviously you got to do a better job than that. 
Uh, but uh, yeah, keep in mind when it matters and when it doesn't. And for most stuff in the home hobbyist shop, aside from Wounded Pride, most things don't matter as much as you might think that they do. So that's it for this project. It's a pair of machinist jacks and uh, they're easy to make and it was a fun little lathe project. And uh, I've already gotten a ton of use out of them on my mill. So if you've got a lathe and you recently got a mill, then uh, this is a perfect project for you. I hope you enjoyed this video and please consider subscribing both here and on Patreon and I will see you next time. Thanks for watching.